And joining us now to talk about your health is Lindsay Goff, nurse and stroke coordinator at the University of Maryland Upper Chesapeake Health. Thank you so much for joining us. It is Stroke Awareness Month. What do you want people to be most aware of concerning strokes? Thank you for having me, Jeff. Of um, there are two things that I would like the public to take from this is re first recognizing the signs and symptoms of stroke and the importance of calling 911 immediately. Also, how to prevent strokes. Primary prevention is the most important thing related to stroke. We don't want to have a stroke. The irreversible damage is something that we can prevent by modifying risk factors. Let's start with recognition. Um, I think most people are familiar with the symptoms and familiar with the idea that it's an emergency. You, you need to get care quickly. Is that what you see in, in practice? Yes, we say time is brain because every minute that the brain is not being perfused, we lose 1.9 million neurons. So recognizing the signs and symptoms is very, very important. In Maryland, we use an acronym, it's called BFAST. It stands for, the B is for balance, so any acute onset of dizziness, headache, um, any loss of balance, any difficulty ambulating. The E is for eyes, so any acute onset of loss of vision, um, peripheral vision or blurred vision, double vision. And then we look at the face. Um, for, the F is for face, so we look at any kind of facial drooping. If one side of your face is drooped and you're unable to drink out of a straw, um, inability to swallow. We also look at the A, um, that is for your arms. So we have patients hold their arms up. Um, you can have an acute onset of weakness in one side of your body or the other or acute onset of both of your legs going numb. Um, then we look at the S, which is for speech. So any slurred speech, any abnormal speech, any word finding difficulties. And then we have the T, which stands for time. So time is truly brain because we lose 1.9 million neurons per minute. I read that you're using artificial intelligence now, AI, in the recognition of, of these symptoms. This is in the emergency department? Yes, so University of Maryland as a system, um, we use these AI applications to, we use it in the emergency room. So when we image these patients that are suspected to have a stroke, it uploads those images to an app, which neurologists, ER providers, and stroke coordinators have the app. So it improves our recognition. It's used as a diagnostic tool. It also expedites the triage of these patients and getting them to treatment and definitive care much faster than we were using before. And um, mortality has been reduced significantly. Good news for people, you know, having a, having a stroke. What, what accounts for that? Improving mortality, again, is by promoting prevention. Um, if we can't promote prevention and we do have a patient that is suspected of having a stroke, we implement these technologies that help us expedite the care and we get these patients to definitive care as fast as we can. How often is it connected with atrial fibrillation, which we hear a lot about. There's a, I think it's a Dr. J radio ad for, uh, for one of the drugs that's used. Um, but people can have that and, and not know they have it. Yes, so paroxysmal AFib, meaning patients go in and out of AFib and can be asymptomatic and not even know that they're in it. It does pose a risk and increases their risk for suffering an acute ischemic stroke. Um, we have two types of stroke in neurology. It's hemorrhagic, which is bleeding, and ischemic, which is a clot obstructing blood flow. Um, the ischemic strokes account for 88% nationally of our strokes, and 94% of those strokes are caused by atrial fibrillation. Tell me about the University of Maryland Medical System Stroke Coordinator Consortium. A yes. lot of words, what is it? Yes, so it is a group of stroke coordinators. So every hospital has one stroke coordinator um, that is in charge of their stroke program and educating the public. So the University of Maryland Stroke Coordinator Consortium, I'm actually the co-chair, we meet monthly and we look at our protocols to see how we can improve them. We look at evidence-based practice. We share ideas and we try to improve care, not as a system, not only as a system, but as a state. There is a Maryland Stroke Coordinator Consortium that I'm the secretary for that and we work not just with the University of Maryland Stroke Coordinator Consortium, but every stroke coordinator in the state of Maryland. One of the things you track is the door to needle time. Yes, what sir. needle? Our door to needle time, that is a measure in stroke that it's the, it means 
the time it takes from a patient crossing our threshold in the emergency room to the time that they receive the IV thrombolytic, which is the clot buster drug to help treat stroke. Um, the national standard is less than 60 minutes to administer this IV thrombolytic from arrival. And um, so there are a lot of things, 60 minutes sounds like a long time, but that means the patient's being registered, they're being assessed by a physician, we're getting vital signs, we're getting an IV, we're getting a finger stick, we're sending blood work, um, we're getting imaging of these patients, we're talking to neurology. So we try to do that under 60 minutes, and the faster that we administer this drug, the better the outcomes are for these patients. And the outcomes can be really good. I mean, yes. these medicines are, are a game changer. How often do you see somebody, I mean, certainly people are fearful of strokes because they've seen people become disabled, yes. but how, how often can somebody walk out of the hospital after one? If patients arrive, we say with the golden hour, so if we can treat patients with IV thrombolytics or acute reperfusion therapy within that first 60 minutes, the better the outcome. Um, again, we lose 1.9 million neurons, so that's the importance of recognition of stroke symptoms. We have a lot of patients that want to wait and sleep it off because they don't know that it is truly a stroke symptom. Um, stroke symptoms are very vague. They differ from person to person. They can be very mild or very severe. They can also be transient, so they can come and go. But the most important thing is to recognize that something is not right by using that BFAST algorithm and getting to the hospital as soon as the symptoms start by calling 911. And that's a, a critical decision, life-changing decision for somebody. What m might make somebody who is experiencing one of the symptoms we, we discussed, the BFAST acronym, what m might make them decide, I'm just gonna take a nap and see if it gets better? Historically and nationally, um, patients are arriving to our hospitals outside of a treatment window. Unfortunately, we only have one set of symptoms to four and a half hours to administer this IV thrombolytic to patients. So again, time truly is brain. Does it happen at a, a certain time of the day? I mean, you've, you've been in the, um, the EMT chair, you've, you've been in the emergency department. With other conditions, I mean, you hear about babies being born at a full moon or, or whatever it is. Is there something similar with stroke? Is it a time of day, day of the week? I wish it was. I wish strokes could be that predictable. Unfortunately, they are not. They can happen at any time, any age. Um, this used to be a disease process that th was thought to just happen to older people. But unfortunately, patients can have a stroke at any time from in the womb up until 100. Wow. Yes. What's the evaluation? We've talked about AI, but as a nurse, how do you evaluate somebody with a suspected stroke? So we utilize a NIH stroke scale. Um, this is a very large scale. It has multiple different components that assess from your mental status, from your awareness to your physical deficits. And what we're looking for when we assess these patients is level of disability. We look to see if what deficits they're experiencing are truly debilitating to them living their everyday life. CDC says that most, most strokes are preventable. Yes. What should people know about that? The two things that I would love people to know is to number one, um, smoking poses the largest risk for having a stroke, so smoking cessation is huge. Um, the way to prevent stroke, we have two different types of risk factors that we look at in these patients. And we look at non-modifiable risk factors. Um, these are inherent factors that people are born with, their age, their race, their gender, their ethnicity. We can't change those, but what we can change is our modifiable risk factors. By smoking cessation, we're gonna keep our blood pressure under control, our diabetes under control, our cholesterol. We're gonna be physically active, have a low fat, low salt diet. And you benefit from those things in, in other ways. I mean, yes. heart, heart <laughs> disease as well. Yes, stroke and cardiac disease go hand in hand, again, with the atrial fibrillation. So if you're decreasing risk, these risk factors just for stroke, you're also lowering these for your chances of having a heart attack. Which is a good deal. Talk a little about TIAs. Yes. Temporary is the T, right? So TIAs, yes, right. TIAs, it's called a transient ischemic attack. Um, these occur with, it's an acute onset of stroke symptoms, neurologic deficit. 
it looks like a stroke, but then it completely 100% resolves within 24 hours, generally much faster within 20 minutes. Unfortunately, a lot of patients think the symptoms went away, I don't need to go to the hospital. Um, I saw that as a paramedic, I saw that as an ER nurse. But what I would love the public to take from it is that a TIA is a warning sign. It truly means that there is a clot somewhere that was obstructing that blood flow and then it decided to travel down a vessel or another, but it truly is a warning sign and patients that experience mini strokes or TIAs are at a larger risk for having a larger ischemic stroke where it does not resolve in the future. So if somebody is in the middle of one of those, um, you would want them to call 911 and come right to the hospital. For some reason they have waited and it's resolved. Yes. Um, what do you want them to do at that point? Even if your symptoms resolve, we still would like you to come into the hospital. And we do a lot of testing surrounding those risk factors that I talked about earlier. And we're looking to see which ones we can modify to prevent this patient from having a stroke in the future. We do a lot of testing. We look at your cholesterol levels. We're gonna look at your heart. And we're gonna look at your um, carotid arteries. We're gonna look at the plaque in your neck. We're gonna look at your BMI. We're gonna look at you know, your diabetes to see what your A1C is. So we're gonna help patients patients that experience these transient ischemic attacks modify risk factors to prevent a larger event. And there is another kind of stroke, which maybe is beyond the, uh, the discussion point here, but is there anything you want people to be aware of connected to that? Yes, so the other type of stroke is hemorrhagic. Um, it's about 12% of our strokes nationally. These strokes generally tend to have a more poor prognosis. So again, symptom recognition, early activation of 911. Lindsay Goff with Upper Chesapeake Health. Thank you so much for stopping by. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.